Hallelujah. Ha, 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 ha. And, um, and so it's just kind of concluding this in Revelation 21 and 22 because we've been through all of the book of Revelation now in the study. Really, we started pretty much in chapter 6 because I want to dive right into the things. You know, I, we set up 4 and 5, chapters 4 and 5. And, uh, you know, we just basically went over, just reviewed real quickly chapters 1 and then the meaning and purpose of chapters 2 through 3. And tonight we include chapter 21 and 22, the new heaven and the new earth. And you can look there in verse 1, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. It's at the power of verse scripture. So tonight I hope to be able to just kind of put this in setting for you and help you to understand, you know, what's gonna, what you got to look forward to. Okay, hallelujah. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Now, this is... This is radical. I'm going to talk to you from 2 Peter tonight about what this means. I'm going to talk to you from Isaiah tonight about what this means. I want you to be able to look forward into the eternal purposes of God. Understand that now we, we, we a thousand years past the tribulation, okay? The question of whether the church is going to go through the tribulation had been long since settled, okay? <laughs> and... and uh, the resurrection, the first, those who are part of the first resurrection, long since settled. Long since settled. And so, you know, you have, you know, you have, as I've taught and as I believe confidently that the Word of God teaches, you have right now the age of the church going on. The age of the church closes with the catching away where we're changed in a moment and twinkling of an eye when the Lord Jesus Christ comes with a shout with the voice of an archangel, the sound of the trumpet, and we're caught up to meet him in the, in the air. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. And then a seven-year period of time in which God now deals with the people of Israel as a nation and fulfills and completes the uh, 70th week of Daniel's vision, the revelation that God gave to Daniel concerning the people of Israel and God's dealings with them. Their bring, the removal, that time period which their veil is removed from off their eyes and their, their, the bringing back in of Israel into uh, a full participation with the purposes of God in his kingdom for which the church is already in. The church is made up of Jew and Gentile. There is no distinction. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. And God in his co covenant uh, faithfulness to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob he reaches in to deal with Israel who is blinded uh, because of their rebellion and disobedience and also as Paul said in part for the bringing in of the Gentiles and then, and I look at that in part only being that the Lord had now turned to deal with all of the nations equally and to uh, then at the end of this age our final, the end of the next age, we could say the end of this age is correct, to turn back and to once again to deal with Israel as a nation, that he might find a harvest there because he's dealt with the nations now for 2,000 years. And there is going to come a place where there is no more harvest. Literally, there's no more harvest, as it was in the days of Noah. There was eight souls saved in the context of hundreds of millions. Come on, right? So, and then we could talk a lot about as it was in the days of Noah. But how, however, Israel, having been blind, being blinded in their rebellion, stuck in their religion, but being the one that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob had taught them that Moses had declared unto him, now God comes and steps in and reaches in for that final harvest uh, among them. Praise God. And then that ultimately concludes the seven years of tribulation, which for the most part, when it comes to the nations, really, it's really ju it's just about God's wrath being poured out upon sin and iniquity. Him finally dealing. His restrained wrath is now released and poured out. It's really, when you read the book of, tri uh, tri book of Tribulation, when you read the book <laughs> of Revelation, it really is about that. It's the judgments of God are being levied upon the nations. And you have to, uh, you, it's, uh, God's dealing with Israel as a nation in the book of Revelation is almost veiled. Because the real issue, you know, is Father dealing with, the, with uh, in a final judgment with sin and iniquity and his disposition towards it. Some people think that God's changed his disposition towards sin and iniquity. 
I didn't, well, book of Revelation is a very clear description that God hasn't changed his disposition towards sin and iniquity. He's still not in a tolerance mood. Hallelujah. And you know, uh, the President of the United States was basically accusing the church the other day that we didn't have the love of God because we didn't agree with homosexual marriage. He's completely and totally mistaken. He's completely and totally deceived in what he believes. And somebody said, that's your opinion. No, it's not my opinion. It's God's opinion because the love of God has no tolerance for sin. It's got all kinds of mercy, but commands men everywhere to repent. That's what he demands, okay? And his people that are united with his heart doing those things that he's doing will be exactly in the same disposition. We will not have fellowship with the unproved proof of works of darkness. Rather, we will reprove them. We will call men everywhere to repent. We will warn them of the coming day of judgment and, and fiery indignation against everyone who does wickedly. Huh? And, and as Paul said it to the Jew first and then also to the Gentile. Amen? And so, now, at the end of the tribulation, uh, the, what we have is we have the finality of the resurrection, the resurrection, resurrection saints. Although God is eternal and his works are eternal and he'll go on and we'll go on with him throughout eternity, there'll be no more resurrected saints. It's done. It's done. It's finished. It's over. It's complete. It's complete. At the end of the seven-year tribulation, it's complete. Now, as the resurrected saints of the living God, we ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ for a thousand years over the nations. And this is something that some people mistake. They fail to realize that many people will survive and come out of the great tribulation and will be living just like men have always been living. Huh? They will be living. And, um, and uh, then and, and they will be multiplying. They will be marrying. They will have families. They would come up from all the nations of the earth, from the isles of the sea. Uh, uh, One-sixth of Egypt would be saved. I mean, the, there's all of these various different actual numerical values given to us in, 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 in certain instances for the, uh, nations of how many people will actually be alive at the end of the tribulation, which will have not taken the mark of the beast, which will, you know, have, uh, you know, miraculously lived through all of the devastation and 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 chaos that will take place over that seven-year period of time. And then the Lord Jesus Christ, he will come, and he will rule, and he will reign. And in that context, the temple that is described in Ezekiel now begins, is, is built. And it's not a temple as, as people might think. It is the temple in which the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ, as it were, um, has as his seat. And from that place, he... Uh, executes his judgment his righteousness and there is a no distinction really or separation between the spiritual realm and what we would call the natural realm right now as right now we have a distinction you have to basically understand and only by the direction of supernatural ability and in terms of the holy ghost to be able to tran to transcend as it were to interact with that realm to participate with that unseen realm People on the other side in the, in the realms of darkness, demon-possessed people, sorcerers, witchcraft, uh, 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 and, and, and other types of, of demonic interaction, they access that realm um, from, from the side of the kingdom of darkness. But during the time of the millennial reign of Christ, there won't be any separation. And, and, and as I've made a couple of points on at the latter part of the tribulation, a certain amount of that separation begins to be broken down between the natural realm and the spiritual realm. Just giving you an example, an angel, angel of the Lord flies through the uh, heavens preaching, declaring the everlasting gospel to men. I mean, you know, so once again, and there's, and there's more points to be made that way. But for 1,000 years then, um, now we rule and reign with the Lord Jesus and we, we know what the scripture says, that we shall see him as he is for we shall be like him. So, we will have the same kind of resurrection that Jesus himself has the first fruits of the resurrection. So what, what do we see Jesus look like after he was raised up from the dead? Was he just a, like a cloud and a mist phasing in and out? You know, no, he wasn't. He, he said to Thomas, he said, put your hands in the scars, put your fingers in the scars in my hand, put your hand here on my side, see, feel me, touch me, okay? And, and he showed us a living, real, tangible, resurrected body that wasn't confined to the same 
physical limitations as the body that he want, that he had when he was uh, be, be, when he was living fully as a man before he died and rose again. And so we know what kind of, we know what what we will be like, and we know that we won't be weird or different or reincarnated or incarnated or, or anything else. We will be as we, as we are. We'll be known as we are. You know, I won't have to look over there and see some kind of, you know, aberration, some misty thing. Say, oh, I think that's Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. They gonna, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be some esoteric, mystical. It's a family. It's glorious. It's beautiful. And, you know, so we have people on the earth for a thousand years, and, then, and they are, are having families, and, and the Lord Jesus is ruling with a rod of iron, and and during that period of time, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that he is destroying the last enemy death. He shall rule until he subjugates all things to the Father. Then the Father shall be come down and shall be all in all. So understand, Father is still, as it were, not a part of it that, that you know, in the, full, in, the, in the full display of who he is. Not a part of what Jesus, you know, in, in the full dimension of what it's going to be, of what Jesus is executing with the resurrected saints as we rule and reign with him for a thousand years. And we smash as a potter smash, uh, smashes a marred vessel of clay into pieces everything that is rebellious, everything that is stubborn, everything that doesn't want to cooperate. And then in the thousand year reign, if, if Egypt or Assyria or one of the other nations aren't willing to participate with God, the scripture says the plagues of Egypt are going to come upon them. The plagues of the books are going to come upon them, really. God's judgments will fall upon them right there in that period of time. It's, I mean, really, there's, he's going to be ruling with a rod of iron, and he's going to be executing his judgments, and, and people can still rebel. Somebody said, well, you know, people can still rebel and do something wrong, and the devil's not around? Yeah, guess what? <laughs> Man has the ability to choose wrong things. And, of course, there will be folks that will have come out of a world that had been ruled by demons and step over into the millennial reign. Does that make sense? And they will have their stories to tell to their children, to their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, and great-grandchildren for a thousand years. Now, the saints, the resurrected saints, we're all going to have things in, that we're supposed to be doing. And uh, Obadiah calls us all messiahs, messengers of God, declaring his word, revealing the things of heaven. Yeah. Upon a thousand mountains, as it were, hundred hundred mountains, I believe, is what Obadiah says. But uh, or uh, it's beside upon every mountain top, and so just saying, you know, here we are. We're ruling and reigning with Christ Jesus. We're executing His will. We're teaching His ways. We're we're you know demonstrating the goodness of God in in in, in every way that uh, you know could be imagined in that time period. At the end of that thousand years. Satan is loose for a little season. Remember, he's bound. His demons are bound with him. I mean, that's one time that the Lord's going to basically, I mean, when the devil is cast out, I mean, he's really cast out. Right now, he just goes out into empty places, seeking some place to inhabit, but finding none, right? Comes and tries to return all the time to people. And many people just go ahead and let him back in. But that time, he's going to be bound. Satan's bound, all of his devils, all of his demons, all the angels that are associated with him, all bound for a thousand years. They have no influence. You'd think things would be a lot better. I'm sure they're going to be a lot better. And, and now the influence is, it's really going to be reversed. Instead of there being so much, you know, of the atmosphere and so much of, uh, of what goes on, the majority of what goes on in our natural life right now is under demonic influence. And it's just demonic propaganda and it's demonic marketing and, and it's demonic examples and demo demonic influences of every sort. And so it's just people just flowing in that current, swept into that current. And it's like we said before, says almost is it easier for people to go all out for the devil overnight than it is to go all out for God overnight. Because there's the atmosphere saturated with the demonic. A thousand years of the atmosphere is saturated by the power of the living God and all the examples and all the, the influence and all the marketing and, and all of the testimonies and all of the, the current is sweeping people towards heaven. Good times, eh? Hallelujah. The lion will lay down by the lamb. Every dimension of the curse will be removed. And uh, 
And the reality of it is, if you want to picture heaven, you're going to have to picture what God did and what he created when he created Adam and Chava, which is who we call Eve, the mother of all living. Chava is her name, which means living. Um, that's, that would be the picture. Father is with them, walking with them, got plans for them, right? Said all the works of his, uh, all, all of his creation, all the works of his hands was set under their dominion. Isn't that beautiful? Right? They, they gave them, you know, a paradise to dwell in. Praise God. I mean, look at the paradise. Look at how beautiful that is. There's nothing of the curse in it. There's nothing poisonous in it. There's nothing evil in it. Praise God. They have the privilege now to, uh, you know, have this wonderful relationship and have this family and replenish the earth and a, a culture that is without ending. And, and before them is set, before them the tree of, of, of life. And you can look here in Revelation chapter 22 and you, you can see the tree of life again. Okay? And so what's going to happen is that uh, everybody's going to get, once again, have the right again to eat of the tree of life. So do you see that? Where is that at? What verse? What verse? Verse what? Verse 2. Night John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. Verse 2, chapter 22. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruit, yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The tree of life is right there again, and people are partaking of it. Beautiful, huh? And so the Lord's creating a new heaven and a new earth. And in this new heaven and a new earth, we, as Peter talks about in 2 Peter chapter 3, what is that, verse 10? It, there is, there, there's dwelling righteousness there. The, the former things are passed away. Everything, everything is made new. So we've got a thousand years, first and foremost, a thousand years. Now this is after the thousand years. So some of you are looking at me confused. This is after the thousand years. I kind of jumped ahead because I wanted to talk to you. What's heaven going to look like? Well, it's what it's going to look like is going to look like what God originally planned when he created Adam and Eve. The thousand years has a certain similitude of that, but not the full impact of it. Certain similitude of it, though, okay, but not the full impact. The lion is laying down with the lamb. The curse is removed. Somebody said, Are they going, is man going to already have, mankind going to already have the rights to eat of the tree of life? I don't know, but I can definitely tell you after the new heaven and the new earth, they will. Because it'll be established. Now, um, it's established rather here in, 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 in Revelation chapter 22. So, trying to go back, try to keep in sequence, not to confuse everybody. So there's a thousand years. And at the end of the thousand years, Satan and all of his demons are loose for a little season. And now the atmosphere is shifted back again to a demonic atmosphere. And literally, the scripture describes to us that people will be gathered to him from every, a great company, like the sand of the sea on the seashore. will be gathered to him from every part of the earth because now in his presence they are able to rebel against God. God gives them an opportunity now not to be under the judgments and the rulership of Christ Jesus under the rod of iron, under the strict regulation of walking in purity and holiness. And now they have the privilege of running into the atmosphere and to the realms of the demonic to rebel against God and to do these things which are, um, are evil. It is at the end of that then that the Lord has the finality of bringing a complete and total conclusion to it all. Now death, the last enemy, is finally destroyed. Okay, so if you would look at the series of events, we can look back in terms of God dealing with Satan, okay? Just going to give you this quickly before I go on talk about the new heaven and the new earth and what it's like and you know the transitions that are going to take place there but when you look back in the history you can see that here satan we don't know his name we call him by his deeds which is adversary okay um he was uh, referred to as the shining one or the lucifer he's the shining one and we know that god had given him a position over the earth and he ruled over 
a society that God had created. And by and large, we look at that as an angelic society. And it came to a place where he was able to ultimately deceive angels. And he led many angels, those who beheld the glory and the presence of God for eons, for, for an, you know, an undefined period of, t of time, which would have been, who knows how long, millions of years, who knows. Um, but at any rate, he was able to lead them away in an act of rebellion against God. And so in that event where he then tried to overthrow God, sometime way back in before the creation of Adam and before the creation of Eve, Ahava, he led them in a rebellion to destroy God, to overthrow God, to subjugate God. And at that moment in time, he was defeated. Jesus, looking back on it, saw, said, I saw Satan cast to the ground as lightning upon the ground. He was, when he came to try to overthrow God, he was immediately defeated. Then God, the earth goes into great turmoil and chaos so that we read in Genesis that the earth was Tavahu Bavahu, which is actually an ancient language that is not really even related to, well, in much of its style, and there's nothing, no other Hebrew words like it. But we do know what it means. It means, it means empty and desolate, a forsaken wilderness, barren place. And there was at this juncture in time nothing visible as Haaretz or earth or land. And so the Lord creates. Now, he recreates. And so we know he recreates on a number of levels just in Revelation chapter 1. The earth has always been at the center of this thing. Why? Because this is where Father dwells. And, and, and I want to go into too much to that tonight, but I'm, I'm going to touch on it as I get on down into Revelation chapter 22. But I want you to think about this with me, okay? I want you to think about this with me. So the Lord recreates. So he tells Adam and, and he tells Hava to replenish the earth. Well, you don't replenish that which is not plenished before. He tells them to replenish the earth and to fill it. And he gave them the same command. He gave the same command to Noah. And this is so important for me to also talk a little bit about Noah and that flood. And I'm going to talk about it in context to 2 Peter chapter 3, here in just a few minutes, thank you. Here in just a few minutes, we're going to just kind of, you know, focus in just a little bit on these, on these terminologies and on this transition that takes place. And so Satan uh, overthrows God's work there in the garden with, with Adam and Hava. I'm going to tell you right now, take a snapshot of that, because we're going to come back to that. Everything's going to come back to that. Father's plan is not going to be thwarted. It's not, it's not going to be stopped. He had an excellent plan, and that plan will be picked back up. There's just been a period of time that has offset that plan, offset that plan and it has been this influence of, uh, of, of, de of the demonic because Adam capitulated. Adam chose to step over into disobedience. He opened up the door for Satan voluntarily said, by and large, Lucifer, Satan, demon spirits, hell, come rule over me. And what came in was death. And when death came in, sin came in. Well, Jesus is going to reign for a thousand years to destroy death and destroy the last enemy sin to where it cannot exist anymore. So that, that is a very, very, very important concept to just grab a hold of, to recognize, wait a minute, the last enemy, death, is going to be destroyed. Well, somebody said, well, well I thought Jesus destroyed him at Calvary. He did, but does Satan believe that he's destroyed? No. And is he still having influence? Yes. But there is, he's not supposed to be able to have influence over us who have been delivered from his kingdom and translated over into the kingdom of the dear son. However, at this juncture in time, we can easily choose to go and return back into bondage. And if we're, if, unless we're walking perfect obedience to the Lord under the authority of his word and under the authority of his spirit, which is not unlike what we're, what's going to be the same kind of situation during the millennial reign of Christ 
if we choose to obey him strictly, then Satan has no power to touch us. He has no power to influence us. He can't put any of his death stuff on us. However, in that context, we know that our bodies are still subject to death, but they're subject to death and the hope. Because, and that's the hope of the resurrection. Praise God. That's just the way Father, he, he put it together. He said he subjected, Romans chapter 8, the, he subjected the creature of man, the creation of man to death. He subjected in hope because with, through that process of that death, there would also be a resurrection. And, and, and that's the results of Adam's transgression and Adam's disobedience. So now there is an escape clause on that one. And that is if we're alive and remain at the coming of the Lord Jesus, then we won't be dying. I'm not planning on dying. People sitting around fearing I'm dying. Oh no, I'm getting old. I'm going to die. I'm going to become ugly. I'm going to become wrinkled. I'm going to become decrepit. I'm going to be, you know, part of the geriatrics, geriatrics club. Whatever. Uh, you know, no, I'm not planning on that. I'm looking for the Lord Jesus to come. And I'm looking to be changed in any moment, instant, twinkling, give an eye. It's a good way to go. Amen. So, the Lord Jesus is going to reign. Now, let me say this again. So here, here Satan's defeated once. He's cast down to the earth, okay? He was empowered by man, but let's just skip that for a minute. Defeated at Calvary. Prince of the, he, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, um, I'll draw all men unto me. He says, now is the prince of this world judge. Now is the prince of this world cast out. Isn't that beautiful? It happened 2,000 years ago. He was judged. He, he, he crushed the head of Satan 2,000 years ago. But what's going to happen now is Satan, once again, during the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation, he comes up against God to fight against God. Once again, he doesn't believe, he doesn't believe he's defeated. He's cast out of the heavens in the middle of the tribulation, comes down to the earth having great wrath, knowing that his time is, is short, and then gathers together the armies of the nations of the earth through his deceptive power, and they come up to fight against God, God in, the, in, in the battle of what's properly known of as Armageddon. And then he's taken and he's bound with a chain and he's cast into hell. Is he defeated? Yeah. But he still don't know it. Okay? And then after Jesus reigns for 1,000 years and it's the final gleanings of the harvest. Okay? In other words, God for this age for almost 2,000 years has been dealing with the nations to bring a harvest. Ultimately, it will come to a point as it was in the days of Noah and where it, in which only eight souls were saved. There's no more harvest, right? You got millions upon millions. There's probably 800 million people on the earth. More than that, maybe. And there's only eight souls that can be saved. That's where this thing is going. There's no more harvest. God turns back to Israel because as though they've been on ice. They've been stuck in their religion, blinded. He goes in there to see if anybody wants to be saved, if anybody wants the eternal kingdom. And there's going to be a, 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 there's going to be a, 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 a saving of them. Then there's going to be these people that come out of the tribulation, and there's gonna, that's going to be the gleaning. That's God's, God's looking for the last possible gleanings you know the last little bit of fruit that could possibly be gathered for eternity in this thousand years and in this period of time the lord jesus christ in this period of time now reigns until as first Corinthians chapter 15 says the last enemy death is destroyed this time it's final it's done it's over it's ever forever over god has forever purged the heavens and all of his creation of all sin and rebellion this is something that people need to get. They don't get this. They somehow believe that we're, God just going to allow sin and rebellion and death and all the mess to just drag on throughout forever. He's not. He's purging everything. And the means by which he purged it was the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by his blood and by the power of his resurrection and through the authority of his divine rulership, everything is subjected. It is, it is hunted it is hunted down. It's searched out, hunted down, and annihilated. And that annihilation is death and hell being cast into the lake of fire. And it's done. It's over. And it's at this juncture that Peter takes up this message talking about the earth and the world. The world that is now is reserved unto the day of fiery judgment okay the earth the new heaven new earth is going it, isaiah described it as being renovated by fire totally purged the heavens and the earth 
and made new. So there is nothing that is impure. There is no germs, no contamination of sin and iniquity left. It's purged. It's purified. And it's really a symbolism of that. Okay? And very, these, these, this, con this concept of this transition is very important to grasp. And, 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 you know, you look at the dimension of God removing the curse even in the thousand-year reign. It goes to a whole nother level in what we call the eternal perfect earth. It's perfect. It's done. Everything's finished. Jesus said 2,000 years ago, it's done. It's finished. I have now dealt with this. And he took his blood. Hebrews said, Paul said, he took his blood. And with his blood, he purged the heavens. That's what it says. That's what the scripture says. He purified the heavens. All of it's now just waiting. It's being reserved until a final judgment. Because Father is going to let sin get as bad as it can get. So that there's a witness for all time that the slightest little bit of sin, slightest little amount of rebellion will ultimately lead to the same conclusion where God's creation will hate God and will not want his life or his ways. And so sin is dealt with. The finality of it is completed. And everybody that enters into this eternal perfect earth is either resurrected saints. Remember, the resurrection is done. It's finished at the end of the tribulation before the thousand years begin. And all of those who during that thousand years not only did they choose to be obedient to God, but at the end of the thousand years did not go and run into the presence of Satan to commit iniquity, to ultimately once again, the fourth time, to once again, to come and try to destroy God. To once again, Gog, which is a person representing the satanic realm, and Magog, which is a terminology that describes nations. God goes and gathers together the Magog, or the nations, to come and fight against God. Gog and Magog is not a geographical location. Those who said that, unfortunately, they were mistaken. Gog is a personification of a rebellious leader, like a Nimrod, or like a Satan, who gathers through his power and his influence the nations of the earth. And they come about and they encamp this uh, about around the saints, of God around the Lord Jesus Christ and the resurrected saints. They're idiots. They, they're going to come and try to destroy, destroy Jesus and his resurrected saints. That's what deception, deception will make you brain dead. It will not cause, it will remove all possibilities of, of rational thinking. It will. And so here they, obviously, and so here they're going to try to come and destroy God, and, and they are destroyed in the midst of a fiery judgment. Now, understand, it is at also at this moment in time that the second resurrection takes place, okay? So the first resurrection, uh, forgive me, yeah, the second resurrection and the judgment of the second, second resurrection, okay, takes place. So, so the first resurrection and the first judgment has already taken place. It took place uh, right along concurrent with the tribulation. Huh. And it did. It did. It's right there at the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. Praise God. And that's where, you know, blessed and holy is he who, have partaker, who, who partakes of the first resurrection. First resurrection is clearly and totally done by the end of the tribulation. Now there's a second resurrection. And this is the resurrection of all the unrighteous dead. Now everybody who died in their sins and who are right now in hell, their body's going to be raised up too. I don't care if their ashes were taken and scattered to one end of the earth to the other. They say that John the Baptist's bones are all over the earth right now because they were special relics of the apostate church. Okay, the early apostate church. And so he's got a finger here, a toe there. Bone. Poor John. <laughs> uh, who knows who's got his head? You know, so be no problem. No problem. His bones going to come together. Praise God. <laughs> And that body, that body, that body that he had, the body. You know, it, it, in ancient Jewish practices, it would like at the inter anniversary of the death, they would go and they would gather the bones and they'd put them in a box and the bones were kept because the bones are important. After the model of what Joseph said, 
take my bones up with you. Because huh? he is, take my bones up. Keep my bones with you because I'm coming up out of the grave. I want to be right there when I do it. I want to be close to you. And that's, that's, what, we, that's what we have in um, the doctrines of God. That's why we don't believe in cremation. The only time anybody gets cremated and their turn, body turned into ashes, that's pagan. That's foreign. That's a curse. If your body was turned into ashes, that was a curse in the Old Testament. So we just don't do that, you know. Somebody said, oh, no, my mama's going to go to hell. She was uh, cremated. Well, you know, we're just going to believe God uh, overtake your ignorance and their ignorance, too. And, you know, just work a work of mercy, right? Because praise God, he, you know, saved and reached out to redeem the Gentiles. And the Gentiles don't have a whole lot of understanding unless somebody, you know, comes and teaches them. So now you have understanding. Your bones are important. And don't matter where they end up. And if they do end up in the ashes, it doesn't matter. And reality of it is, it's going to end up in fine dust anyways. But the Lord's going to raise that up. Okay? Now that second resurrection is, is proof that everybody has a part of being raised up. And that happens at the end of the thousand years. So here it is. They come, all of this host comes out with Satan to destroy the camp of, of God. A, a fiery glorious renovation of the power of God. You talk about a serious explosion. They are destroyed by the breath of God. It's hell and the grave, hell and death are cast into the lake of fire, and everybody is raised up in some moment of time in that interval to now stand before the great white throne judgment to which all heaven and earth flee away at it. Okay? So are you with me? And so I want to... I want to just kind of, I want you to picture that in the future because we're so unfortunately we got a little bit of the bad stuff before we get over to the good stuff. But the one thing that I want to just really solidify for you is that God's plan may have been interrupted, but it wasn't canceled. So what God's going to do is, is when, you know, I'm going to go back and look at a couple of these things with you in Scripture, but it's just so that you get a, com, a full, you know, congruent, you know, story here. I want you to recognize that when the new heaven and the new earth, is created. You've got God the Father coming and dwelling with us in all the fullness of His glory. But because 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that Jesus must reign to the last enemy. Death is destroyed and then it is made known that Father is acceptable and Father comes down and we see Father come and He is all in all and Jesus delivers up the kingdom unto Him. That's pretty radical, isn't it? People, that is a radical doctrine in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 beginning right around verse 24. Hallelujah. Father comes rule. Jesus reigns until ultimately everything is brought into subjection. The Father turns it over to Father and Father's all in all. And Father's the one who's ruling over all now forever and forever. And what happens is at that moment in time, we see the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven. Somebody said, Yerushalayim. It's just an earthly, physical um, place. Uh, Yerushalayim, Basav, Sava. You know, we've seen the song uh, about Jerusalem, you know. But at any rate, talk about Jerusalem, the earthly Jerusalem, as though, you know, it's God's capital and, you know, there's something deified about it. it but reality of it is, is this. It was named after what's going on in heaven. What's going on in heaven was first. Not what's going on in earth. Zion is from heaven. It's not a mountain in Israel. It's in heaven. It's a, it, it was named after what's going on in heaven. So all of a sudden, at the end of this thousand years, we can read about it right here. Now, in, um, I think we have to, to go back and, and, and to chapter 21, and it should be somewhere around like verse 9 or verse 10, something like that. I just was, didn't uh, put all my verses of Scripture out in front of me today. But is it what? Is it verse 9 or is it verse 10 or chapter 21? Okay, where all of a sudden he saw the new Jerusalem as a bride. Huh? 10. Revelation 21, 10. So what did, what did John get to see? He got to see at the end. Now it's the end of the thousand years. It's the earth has been re totally renovated by fire. The heavens have been totally renovated by fire. It's a new heaven and a new earth. It's a different one. It's a different cosmos. How with no demon in it, with no Satan in it, with no lie in it, with no sin in it, with no iniquity in it. Beautiful. Out, death is completely annihilated, now finally and totally destroyed. It's completely removed. And it's such an important thing to grab a hold of here. It, it's something that needs to be emphasized. So you said that already. I need to say it a billion times more. It, it's totally annihilated. God's purging it. He's purging it. The, the universe of it all. 
And now what happens is the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. This is the bride. This is the bride. The lamb's wife. You know, somebody said, well, the bride is the church. The bride is more than the church. The church is just part of that bride. The new Jerusalem, <clears throat> the city of God, it's the bride. Who is it made up of? It's made up of all of God's faithful creation. It's made up of all God's faithful saints. First and foremost, it's made up of, the, it's made up of every saint since Abel. Somebody said, are angels there? Yeah, but they're not the bride. The Lord said something special with us. And it's not to try, it's not a man's story to try to deify man in a self-serving purpose. God created us and shaped us in his image and his likeness to rule over angels. He gave us a unique purpose. God did something new. He did something new when he shaped man in his own image and his likeness. He didn't make man like angels with a celestial body. He confined us to a terrestrial body from the very beginning. For, for reasons that we'll understand more perfectly later. And I, I, I'm certain that, that learning uh, dependency and humility and brokenness and being willing to be a part of his love and his relationship, every part of life describes that. Marriage between a man and a woman, the, the very union that creates the beauty of eternal life, lives that go on existing forever, in other words. Children, that's what I'm talking about. You know, as people think, what are you saying? A union that creates <laughs> eternal lives. A union that creates children. They're eternal. They're eternal live lives. They're eternal beings. They're going to be somewhere forever. God didn't create. This is the means by which he did it. Angels, he would imagine, imagine angels would create each one of them one by one by the Lord. God created one man, one woman, and from them sprang forth all of humanity. Pretty radical thought, isn't it? Giving, with us, giving us a capacity that doesn't exist in anywhere else in his creation. And of course, Satan and evil is going to get in there and he's going to twist and pervert and distort that thing and make it ugly and, and defile it on every, on every level if he can. But I can stop God's plan because ultimately what's going to happen, he's going to create new heaven and new earth. And ultimately what happens is here we are, the bride of Christ, the new Jerusalem. When we see him, we will see him as he is, for we shall be like him, which is a powerful message, which is almost like you feel like you need to put your hand over your mouth when you even say that. And so therefore we see the magnitude of it, the beauty of it, the call of it, and thus we're arrested and say, yes, everybody who has this hope will purify themselves even as he is pure because what a high calling, what a holy calling. What a privilege, what an honor. I mean, to be heir of God and co-inherited with Jesus. Of course, that's already begun, but that then explodes into a whole other dimension. By the time we step into the millennial, and then it's millennial reign, and then it explodes into a whole other dimension by the time we enter into the last age, the last phase, that which will go on uninterrupted for ancients of days without end. And that's the new heaven and the new earth. Hallelujah, <laughs> which we look forward to, which we run towards, which we hasten towards, which there's no, uh, there's no suffering that is even worthy for a second to be compared to the glory that should be revealed in us. There's no hardship, no trial, no difficulty that can be even possibly weighed against what God has purposed for us to have throughout the ages without end. My goodness, like bring it on. It don't even matter. I mean, just as I got this, having that is worth going through whatever's necessary. And that's why these things that we're talking about are so important to understand because it causes us to have the vision of where, the, where we're going in the future. What is this really all about anyway? What is the magnitude of it? And, you know, the religions that Satan has created completely removes all that. Like Hinduism, it's pure, perfectly circular. And thus, there is no reason to have a vision or a future or a passion or a purpose. And you just you avoid, devoid yourself of all desire because you're just going to come back to the same spot anyways. You know, and, and that's about the best man can do. That's about the best the devil can do in all of his distorted stuff. Father's got a place for us. 
Malanga de Arasatusht. Brava de. You can't even begin to imagine how beautiful it is. We, we take the best possible scenario that you could think of, and the lion laying down with the lamb, the children putting their hand in the cockatrice den, and there is no poison, and there is no death, and there is no tears, and there is no sighing, and there is no sorrow. And you take that and you multiply that by an unimaginable creative love and grace and mercies of God, and that's what you got to live in forever. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing to see the throne of God come down out of heaven. And it will, it will, it will, the city won't need the sun or the moon. Doesn't mean that the sun and the moon won't exist because the solar system will exist in some form. But the reality of it is the light of the city. He, he's the light of the city. And the city, the city is, is huge. It's like 2,400 by 2,400. I mean, it's huge. Miles. I mean, it's like you could, no matter where you're at, at dusk, you'll be able to look somewhere and see the, the glow of the city from any dead place upon the face of the earth. There's the city. Oh, we're going to go to the city next week. We can go spend some time. That's what the peoples of the earth would say. We're going to be living in the city. The resurrected saints. We, just live, we are part of that city. Oh, hallelujah. We're part of this glorious thing that is going on that defines the imagination. And God's God, the continuance of what he purposed for Adam and Eve to be doing going on. And that's why the, one of the functions of the, of, the, of the river that pours down out of this mountain that is a series of mountains that Isaiah described this mountain, a series of mountains. And out of the top of the mountain, this is the New Jerusalem he's describing. It's the top, the top of the mountain that's way up there, you know, 2,400 miles or so, something like that, way up there. High, okay? Can you imagine that? 2,400 miles up? Think about that. And at the top is where his throne is. Hallelujah. We're all living somewhere around. And I want to be right there as close as I can be. Somebody said, can I have a farm in heaven? You won't want one. You know, I mean, think about what that is. That celestial city, the city of God, the New Jerusalem, that, that will exist forever. The beauty and the glory of it that is so futuristic that it kind of can't even possibly imagine the beauty and the splendor of it. And what's also going on is what Father planned to do with Adam and Chava, or Adam and Eve, is continuing going on at the same time, and that they are filling the earth with that which Father has purposed to do in a plan that he has not fully divulged to us, that is just nothing but speculation when people want to think about it. And anything that man thinks about concerning what God's going to do in the eternal future, it don't even come close. Why? Because Father's got a better uh, a more brilliant plan uh, than anything that any human being could ever come up with. So, hallelujah. It's just true. I want to look with me quickly. And, of course, you know, uh, just saying, you know, the, out of the top of the mountain, I was saying this, out of the top of the mountain uh, flows this river of pure living water, this uh, something that it takes the concept of H2O and what water does for us to a whole nother level. I mean, take water away from any living thing, and what do you have? Nothing, okay? Sand, okay? But it, wherever the water flows, there's life in the natural. Wherever the water flows, there's life in the spiritual. Now, you take this river of living water. It's living. It's creates. It's creative. You, you take it, if you could imagine, if you took a little handful of it, you threw it out like this, everything that was dead would instantaneously live. Everything that was a wilderness would instantaneously bloom. If people if it was flown, if it was thrown over a bunch of dead carcasses, they would all raise up to life again. It's that kind of, it's that kind of water. It's that kind of life. It's that kind of life-giving power, something creative, a means by which God it communicates that, 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 that life-giving power. Of course, we know that Fundamentally, he does it through his word. He declares through his word. But there's these elements of things that God uses. And out of that river, what do we see in Revelation chapter 22? We see growing the tree of life. And it's not just one. It's not just one tree of life in the midst of the garden. It's trees of life everywhere. Look at that. You can see that right here. Trees of life everywhere. And so he says, in the midst of the streets. In the midst of the streets. <laughs> Hallelujah. In the midst of the streets. And that's the celestial city to begin with. The most important thing to find. In the midst of, and this is huge, remember, it's huge. In the midst of the streets, 
of it. And on either side of the river was there a tree of life, which bare 12 manners of fruit, yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Can you just imagine? Everybody comes up just like Adam and Eve, their children, their grandchildren, their great grandchildren, their great great grandchildren, their great 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 for, you know, billion years. And they're all coming up to eat of the tree of life to take of, of the leaves, to enjoy the worship and the presence and the goodness of God. Every man, just like Adam and Eve, every human being, just like Adam and Kava, come to partake of that tree of life with a terrestrial body. To have something that we can't even begin to imagine. It's not, it's not going to be too far off. I don't believe it's too far off from the resurrected saints. But it's still unique. Isn't it beautiful? The things that God has planned. People think it's just like, you know, there's this predeterminate thing going on. And then God created Adam and Eve to, to fall into the miserable disobedience and terrible life. My, what a, what a twisted, warped, negative view of things. I, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that. I have a much more benevolent look at God than that. I, I see God as a much more generous, loving, purposeful uh, person than that. He creates for life, not for death. Obedience, not for disobedience. Huh? For righteousness, not for wickedness. Give me a break. People wrestling the Scripture to their own destruction because they misunderstand a few verses of Scripture here and there. Come on, man. The fundamental way to understand verses of Scripture to start off with is to see that God is love and then understand it through that, uh, th that beauty and that glory and understand that in that love there is no place for sin and iniquity and death. And that understand that death and sin and iniquity are synonymous and so there's no tolerance for death inside of life. There's no agreement of it. There's no place for it. Because people want to try to take love and superimpose it upon, you know, people being able to do whatever they want to do and mess things up as bad and trash everything. No, it ain't love. It ain't love. We're going to let some one person run around and trash everybody's life. It ain't love. You know, it ain't going to let him run around and trash everybody's life for too much longer. He's going he's to be bound. Satan! You know it! You're already bound. Your days are numbered. Prepare for the lake of fire. And I mean, it'd be helpful for you if you start dealing with them like that. Quit listening to them. And come under his influence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You take up your divine authority in God knowing that that is the truth. You just tell devils to get out. Out of here. Ruthiana was yelling. I was it was Phil and and with Sharon leaving the park and Ruthiana's yelling out something at me. I said, "Did you hear that? Can you hear it? Can you hear the sound of the preacher? Can you hear the sound of the anointing? It's there when you've been anointed by God to speak. It's there. <laughs> and not only can someone who's discerning of spiritual gifts hear it." The devil can hear it too. He knows the sound of the anointing. He knows it. And I pray that every person in this place, that you so sell out to God's divine purpose, that every part and dimension of the vibrations that come from out of your mouth and out of your throat and out of your belly scares the hell out of hell. And they got to leave. Every demon spirit has to evacuate. <laughs> Hallelujah. Has to evacuate just hearing you speak. Hearing you ask for a box of Cheerios, they gone because the anointing of it. Hallelujah. Spoke on the Mastatea. Part of the reason we give ourselves to tongues because it is a place of giving ourselves over to the sounds of heaven, the authority of God's voice, that everything that is unlike God has to leave, has to be, has to evacuate, has to be burned up, has to be cast out, has no power, no ability in our lives. And it's all through the, 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 the power and, and, and the, and the life-giving ability of the blood of Jesus Christ that destroys death. The blood that canceled everything that Satan tried to do and sin and tried to impose upon us. Mm -mm -mm. I love hearing people... Yell at me across the parking lot. Hear the sound of the anointing and that yell. Come on, people. Get yourself a voice. 
Don't you let anything take that voice away from you or dilute that voice. Come on now. Let it get, let it get strong. <laughs> Amen. And become powerful. I mean, taught us today. The Word of God is living. It's powerful. And God has purposed that His Word be heard out of our mouth where we function under the inspirations. Hallelujah. The inspirations of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. That's the sword of the Spirit that's been given to you and me. Praise God for the anointing. Oh, just real quickly, I know I've probably already gone into overtime because it's just hard for me. I don't know what it means to have a short meeting. Even I try to define for myself a short meeting and, and it just doesn't come natural. So 2 Peter chapter 3, and I'm going to go with what comes natural because I'm by nature a part of the living God, by the Spirit. I did what not just naturally. Hallelujah. I've been born of the Holy Ghost, been given the divine nature. I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. I'm in Him. Hallelujah. And so I just live in this wonderful thing, fulfilling the law of God by nature. Hallelujah. I don't believe in no two natures, nothing. Huh? You either, you either, your father's the devil and you got his nature, or your father's God and you've been born of the Spirit and you got his nature. Decide which one you want and get with the program. Amen. Amen. Quit being double-minded. If there's anything that describes double-minded to me is that. <laughs> I don't know who's my dad. It's hard to break into 2 Peter chapter 3 to begin to describe these things, but what I'm going to do is I just want to show you something beginning here at verse 5, for they willingly are ignorant. Many people are that. Verse 5, 2 Peter chapter 3, because God certainly didn't create anybody ignorant. Ignorance is a description of deception. You understand me? It's a, it's a mental block, ignorance. It's a place you're void of understanding. You don't know, okay? And so many are will, willingly ignorant for that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and then in the water, Okay? whereby the world that then was was overthrow over the cosmos that then existed was overflowed with water and perished understand that when people want to make this Noah's flood this was not Noah's flood because we live in this same cosmos that that uh, Noah lived in nothing's been changed even the same grass vegetation animals everything the same cosmos prior to that this what Paul, what uh, forgive me, Peter is talking about is he's talking about another cosmos, a cosmos that existed before Satan tried to overthrow God. That cosmos was shut down and thrown into total outer darkness under the judgment of God, under God's first judgment when a, when Satan was first destroyed and all of his host was cast into darkness. And so that was where we see in the beginning Bereshit bara Elohim. In the beginning, God created. Um, uh, the heavens, ha, the Shamayim, the Ha'eris, the heavens and the earth, and uh, Vayahi, the Tohu Vavahu, and became the uh, ha, Vayahi Ha'eris, Tohu Vavahu, and the earth became empty and desolate, barren and void, became a wilderness and a dark place. And, the, and water was over the face of the deep, and there was just nothing but darkness. There was a different cosmos because when you look in Revelation, I mean, forgive me, when you look at Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, now the Lord is creating a whole new cosmos, a whole new divine order within the structure of his universe, okay? He had caused a man of the stars to withdraw their shining, separating completely all that exists in him from all that Satan tried to do when he led innumerable numbers of angels against him. And they, he threw them into a place separated in every way from him and a total out of darkness, a total outer darkness. And everything that they had touched became dark and everything they were part of became dark. Desolate, empty. Huh? And when the Lord now creates a new cosmos, He now speaks a divine order and He says, He says, the first thing He calls for is light to begin to shine again. He says, Let the light come and the light did. He said, Let the light be and the light was. <laughs> Just that simple. And then somebody said, Well, that's all messed up. Let the light be and the light was. That's all messed up because He didn't get around to creating the sun, the moon, the stars till later. No, when He steps in. 
Light steps in. There's no need for the sun and the moon and the stars when he's there because he's the light of it. So he said, light be. So he said, he, he, he actually invited his presence back in, okay? He himself invited him light to come back in, his presence to come back in. He begins, he doesn't do anything outside of his presence. And the Ruach, the, the, the Holy Ghost, the, the Spirit of the Lord, uh, the Ruach, uh, Yehoah's Yeho, Ruach, or the Father's Ruach, or the Father's Spirit, begin now to brood over and hover over the face of the deep. And God began to bring forth his creation. And he said, let the earth appear again. Let the dry land appear again. Remember, appear again. Remember in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth now is without form, without glory. It's desolate, it's empty. And there's darkness over the face of the deep. And the first thing the Lord says is let the higher, let the earth appear again. Huh? And so if it wasn't that way, then the logical progression would have been that God created the heavens and the Hamayim. Or the earth, or the waters. Okay, he created the heavens and the and the merachetet, or the deep. Okay, he didn't create the heavens and the merachetet. He created the heavens and the dry land, the earth. Uh, but the dry land, the earth, was covered, desolate, empty, surrounded by this chaos. It's not some. It's not the primordial condition. Uh -uh. No, it's the state of the chaos. Now this new earth, this new heaven, and this, uh, the, and then God creates this this heaven and this earth that we're living in right now. And then there was another flood it because, because of, of, of man's sin and iniquity, because led by Satan's deception. And so God destroyed the earth. And, but he didn't destroy the heavens. Huh? God, God destroyed the earth in the sense, he didn't destroy the earth. Forgive me, I misspoke. He destroyed man upon the face of the earth. Everything that had the breath of life in its nostrils was destroyed. So man and beast. Everything, except for that which went into the ark. And then this is an important thing to understand the new heaven and new earth. I want you to grab a hold of the new heaven and new earth. I haven't even got to Isaiah tonight. I probably want to get, I'm going to at least touch on it just real quickly just to help you see in Isaiah 65, verse 22, I believe it is. Isaiah 66, there's a couple of different verses of scripture there. It talks about a new heaven and a new earth. It's going to be consumed with fire. The, for the old heaven, the, uh, the, old, the, the former things of the, uh, will pass away. The former heavens and the former earth will be destroyed. And, and, and consumed with fire. Listen to this one here, because you're going to get it here as well. Now I'm trying to go too fast and uh, stumbling all over the place, but here we are. Now, whereby the world that then was, then was being overflowed with water perished. But look at this, but look at this, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now. These are the same ones that's been around since Adam, okay? Same ones, are you with me? Same ones. This is the ones that was created in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2 which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto the reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men god is going to blow the thing up he's going to purge it he's purged it with blood he's going to purge it with fire He's going to create it new. And so we, we see a new heaven and a new earth. And there are many things about that. We can think about our own life in terms of redemption. He's created us to brand new. This is the old things that are passed away. We are already living in that, in, that, in that future day. We already are partakers of that future day. It's already in our being. The new heaven and new earth is already with us and in us because of who we are in him because he's in us and with us. And he's already connected to that. So I want to get to too mystical for you here or too spiritual for you however you want to look at it but but here's what the lord says look at this he says verse 9 he's long suffering he's not willing to any perish this is why the lord's waiting you hear this can you see verse 9 why why don't papa get this done he's long suffering not willing that any perish father has was waiting for the precious fruit of the earth to come forth He's waiting for everyone who can be harvested to be harvested. He's waiting for everyone who will receive life and will receive the instruction of his ways to accept those things that he, that he has planned and purposed for us. But the day, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Listen to this. Now understand, Peter received this from the Lord in a unique context, and you're going to have to be careful with it, too. He didn't, you can see Paul received cer certain things about future events in a unique context. You have to plug them in to the full revelation. 
because they re, the, the Lord didn't give them the full revelation like he gave John. He gave Paul some parts of the revelation concerning the end day, and he gave Peter some parts of the the revelation concerning the end day, end time. He gave Daniel some parts of the revelation concerning the end time. He gave John the full picture, basically, okay? So we don't go and try to understand the full picture in context of a part. We understand the part in context of the full picture. Doesn't that make sense? We do that in every other area of life. We need to go ahead and do it here, too, because it just makes sense. So, understanding that, he says, the day of the Lord sh is, uh, sh uh, shall come as a thief in the night. This is not talking about, verse 10, is not talking about the catching away of the church. It's not talking about something in the book uh, that, that, that deals with the tribulation. He here is talking about what's going to happen in the end of days, at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ, when Satan comes to try to gather together all men to once again overthrow God, and that day will come as a thief in the night. They won't be ready. You're not ready for a thief in the night, by and large. When a thief comes in the night and is able to steal something from you, it, he, you're not ready for him, you know. It, and that's really the, the, the description. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. That isn't going to happen in the tribulation. That is going to happen at the end of the thousand-year reign when God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth that we read about there in Revelation chapter 21. And this is what he says. In which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? That's why the fear of the Lord needs to be in our life. And the fear of the Lord is not going to be in our life unless we know what is going to happen in the future and how Father feels about things. Looking for... a. Uh, Listen to it now. Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God. This is not talking about the Lord Jesus coming. This isn't talking about anything that's going to happen in the catching away. It's not talking about anything that's going to ha happen um, during the tribulation. This is at the end of the age. It's at the end of the thousand years. He says, the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, a we, according to the promises, look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. That's, just, that's, when, that's at the time when all of a sudden that, that Jesus has finished reigning for a thousand years, us reigning with him, and now he's destroyed the last enemy, death, as is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and as is described in Revelation chapter 21, verse 10, the new heaven and the new, I mean, the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven with Father himself, Jehovah, Father himself, reigning and dwelling in the top of the mountains and now rules over a new heaven and, and a new earth. A whole new cosmos set up, saturated with his divine presence, under his divine order, with no fingerprint of sin or iniquity upon it. No fingerprint, no finger, none, none. This is better than purifying gold to 99.99%. This is purified all the way to 100% pure. 100% Holy Ghost, living God, ways of life, no death in it. Hallelujah. Now, quickly, just so I can wrap this up, just to give you a little taste of what else is, could be found out here in the wonderful descriptions of God as he spoke by his holy prophets, Isaiah chapter 65 stands out as one that you just got to touch on. And uh, it's Isaiah 65. And I believe we'll find, um, let's see, uh, verse 17. Listen what the Lord says. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the, in the, he's, he puts this in the context of people just obeying him and walking with him. For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered, nor shall it come to mind. Isn't that beautiful? You talk about removing sin as far as the east is from the west. People say, how could there ever been a time where people killed each other, hated each other, 
committed adultery and fornication? How could there ever been a time where this wickedness and this twistedness and this defilement against God and the beauty and the splendor of his life and his ways, how could have men ever been so evil? How could have angels ever imagined doing such a thing? The former things shall pass away. And neither shall they come to mind. They won't even be able to be remembered. But it's not, it doesn't use the word, word, Hebrew word zakhar which, zakhar, which is to remember. It doesn't use that. It says it won't even be able to be thought of. It won't even be able to be conceptualized. So it's not remembered. It's they won't even be able to conceptualize. How is it possible? I want to live in that consciousness now. That's why I talk about it. It's not theoretical for me. It's not looking for another day and just trying to mitigate the situation that we're in now. It's a heavenly vision. It's a new mindset. It's a new way of thinking. It's a new way of viewing things. I want to view things to the eternal purposes of God. I want to understand things in view of how He understands them. If I live in that, if we'll live in that, if we'll have that consciousness, He'll be before us and not our right hand so we will not be removed. We'll be fully bought in to why he says don't do that don't partake of that don't be involved in that don't look at that have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness don't allow the lust of the flesh the lust of the eye and the pride of life to be in you because that's all the stuff that is going to be destroyed that's all the things that's going to be burned up that's everything that loves a lie and and is an offense to life and to me and that's why paul then i mean peter rather has this crescendo what manner of holy lifestyle should we have believing this that's why John says, if we have this hope, we purify ourselves just even as, just like he is pure. Because we want that more than anything. I want that. I'm running towards it. I'm hastening towards it. I want that part in, 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 in the purposes of God that, that, uh, to be, participate with a new heaven, a new earth, to live in the city, uh, 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 the holy city of God, the new Jerusalem that, that comes down in heaven more than anything else. It'd be terrible for people who have the knowledge of God to be burning in hell with a bunch of hate and demons and everything that is full of death. This times everything that Satan is just knowing they could be in the city. They could be in the glory. Just to recognize, to think. Think about it now. Though you don't make the mistake to fall after the same manner of perdition or deception or delusion. Huh? I just cry out to God every day, Father, I want to dwell in the city. Father, I want to be with you. Father, protect me. Father, keep me. There's an urgency in the tone of my voice. Huh? There's a great need in the tone of my voice. Why? Because these things are established in the heart. We want them to be established in your heart, and that's why we're here tonight. And, that, and praise God for the people who are devoted to getting this stuff up and running for the web and, and for the YouTube, because I want this to be in the hearts of every possible person I can touch. The Word of God will change you. It will transform you. It will establish you. The Word of God, in graph the Word of God, is able to save your soul. It's able to fill you with the knowledge of God and the passions of the Holy Spirit so that you're able to stand against all the lying deceptions of Satan and the powers of darkness. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. And so what, maybe one verse of Scripture more of Isaiah 66. Anybody can shout it out. Um, if you know exactly where I'm going, just shout it out. And But, you know, if you don't, I'll find it too. Because it just kind of stands out there, doesn't it? Yeah. Verse 22. It just stands out there and waves at you, doesn't it? Hello. Hallelujah. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And that is something that is a promise to everyone who's willing to keep his covenant. Hallelujah. Isn't that great? My, my. You know, it's wonderful to know that we didn't find him, that he found us. That's security, isn't it? Hallelujah. It's wonderful to know that he saved us, we didn't save ourselves. Hallelujah. It's wonderful to know that we didn't beg him and talk him into including us, that he begged us and talked us into including, being included. Huh? It's wonderful to know, hallelujah, that uh, he sought us out. He searched us out. It's wonderful to know. And he takes it to another level. Jesus took it to another level. It's, another, it's a level that I could have never imagined he would take it to. And I, it's just like, whoa. He said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And he says it to all mankind. Because God's not willing that any perish. 
That's the context. And that's why he died. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. And he says, you didn't choose me. You refused me. You rejected me. That's Adam. You refused me, Adam. You rejected me, Adam. You didn't choose me. I stepped forward and chose you, said, I want you back. Adam, where you at? I hid because I was afraid. Who told you that you were naked? It's Eve's fault. Eve's. Snake's fault. Satan's fault. The Lord doesn't get in the big midst, midst of the finger pointing. He just declares what he's going to do to save them, to rescue us. Let our, let, our, let our hearts be so united with him that we're so full of his love and his mercy we forgive everybody like he forgave us. Uh, let us love, because I mean it's fundamental, it's fundamental to walk with God. Because if you can't forgive, he's not going to forgive you. Just grab a hold of this love of God. Let this love of God rule in you. Let this love of God reign in you uh, by the knowledge of his word, by the knowledge of who he is, by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let this love be that which consumes every dimension of your life, no matter what's coming at you, no matter what kind of hardship, no matter what kind of trouble, no matter what kind of opposition. Let this love reign. Let this love reign because he that dwells in love, this, look, this kind of love dwells in God. And that's all about dwelling with him forever. Not just for a little short period of time. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In him shall I trust. He's my glory and the lifter of my head. Hallelujah. 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 Don't let sadness fill your heart. Let faith fill your heart. No matter what's going on, no matter what's happened in the past, no matter what surrounds you, no matter where, where your loved ones are at, stay over in the place of faith, knowing that God's going to do the work. That should always make you happy when you know that God's going to do the work. You think about the crisis and the situation, but you know God's for you who can be against you. When you know God's going to do the work, you'll immediately get happy. If you're wondering whether it's going to happen or not, you sit, look at the state, and you're consumed by the state and the sort of things that you're having to deal with. Oh, my, it's enough to make you give up, die. <laughs> it's make you enough to make you to be sad and sorrowful. Oh, but believe in God. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places. And it's right there in the New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. Ha-ka-na-na-ne-ki-shi-ka-na-na-na-mo-ta-ho-ha. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting, isn't it? I love just standing around and thinking about these things. It's to get you in a prayer meeting anytime. Just start thinking about the new heaven and the new earth. There's such great inspiration here. Begin to shout, begin to praise Him. What happens is many times we get swamped with the activities and circumstances of this life and we're just stuck, overwhelmed with the issues. And we don't even know where to begin to be happy because we've been just inundated with the wrong kind of an atmosphere. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, you be atmosphere makers because you're not going to come under that stuff. You're not, you're not, hey, listen, you're going to stay in the light, not dwell in the shadows. Jesus' name. As soon as this stuff hits you, keep your heart with all diligence. How do you keep your heart with all diligence? You submit yourself to the Holy Ghost, begin to praise Him, worship Him, say, thank you, Father. I can't deal with this. I don't know what to do for this person, this situation. But, Lord, I know that you're about working a miracle, and I just give it over to you, and I just thank you. But see through the eyes of faith, right? Because faith is the hypostasis. It's the place that where we can stand. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Say, thank you, Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let God fill your mouth with the fire of the Holy Ghost. I was one day, I was just talking to some preachers, not just trying to say, it, who was taught this, remind me of it, just talking about the fire of God being in your voice. I was sitting in the room, and I would, they, somebody said something, I was just going to talk a little bit about hypostasis, and I said hypostasis, and they thought I was speaking in tongues, and every one of them fell into the fire of God. <laughs> it is an amazing thing. I, they, and, they go, and, I, and I went on and tried to explain <laughs> what it was was on my heart to say. Hallelujah. And, the, and, and, you know, and it was just a Holy Ghost breakdown. I was going to try and talk a little bit about you know, faith and just knowing that you've got a great place to stand. I'm telling you, people, give yourself over. Give yourself over. Huh. 
Give yourself over to speaking the word. Give yourself over to speaking by the Spirit. Oh, Ramana Neshi. Heaven will feel the sound of your voice. Hallelujah. Kana Somun. The sound of your voice will be heavenly. Amana Neshi. Impart the things of God. Lo Katana. Hallelujah. Sikataina Mesiti. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, this is it. This is the last in this study uh, for now on uh, the book of Revelation. And, you know, I'm going to do it again sometime in the near future because we're, I'm trying to finish up my new book on the rise of the seventh and eighth kingdom. And I'm being very careful with it because it's just, it's shaking and it needs to be a shaking thing. But I, I can't, you know, I, I just pray for me in this, in this situation because I've just got to have wisdom on how I put it all together. And I'm juggling with that right now, you know. Because I can't overwhelm people too much. But, you know, we got this new thing going on that Islam is, you know, the, uh, the, the eighth kingdom, the beast kingdom. And it's not even, it's not, that's just not even, you know, it's a distraction. And, you know, we want to be able to get people focused on what they need to be focused on. And what they need to be focused on is that how terrible and evil sin is to not have a part of it. And understand where this thing is going so that they can be prepared to deal with where the, where the real battlefront is in the realms of witchcraft and sorcery and the satanic and the deceptive power of the enemy that works far more subtly than what ISIS or Islam is doing. And somebody emailed me, a preacher actually emailed me and said, well, I just finished reading the book. It's really a book about, uh, I haven't heard from this person in quite some time. And said, I, I just read a book about so-and-so. Just He wrote this book on how describing Islam as the eighth kingdom. And I thought about you. Because back in 1981, I would tell people. Because that's what I thought. I, saw, I thought I saw in the word and in a perfect match that Islam was the eighth kingdom. And uh, so I, you know, I had to tell the person, I said, uh, sorry, but uh, I don't believe that anymore. Um, the Lord showed me that it was something far more sinister. And I'm writing a book on it right now. And of course, I heard nothing back, you know, because, you know, when, 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 when you know, it's, things get popular and, you know, if you're not going with the popular trend, you're, you know, you're not popular. But <laughs> I want to, you know, I just want to do this thing right. I, I'm believing God to open up doors to be able to do it in a way to where that it's going to impact people and they're going to look at it, and they're going to read it, they're going to consider it, and the Lord's going to use it as seed. I want it to be purely His Word. I want no speculation in it. You know, there's some things that aren't fully revealed and connecting the dots, and I have to be careful about how I connect the dots so the full impact can be, can be realized. And... Uh, and really, the full impact is I want people to see the horrors of sin. I want people to see the deception, the satanic, the demon power behind every form of sin and really get the issue where it's at so that people from the, in their daily life would make the right choices to yield to the Holy Spirit, to choose God and to live. Before we close, is there any questions that anyone has for me? I, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah. During a thousand year reign, there will be no new heaven and new earth yet. It will be the exact same earth that went through the tribulation. Is it going to be a mess? It's going to be pretty messy. It's going to be pretty messy. The people that come out of the tribulation will get married and have children. They'll do exactly what God originally intended when he created Adam and Eve. And they'll... They could, if they choose to walk with the Lord, they will live forever. They will go and eat of the tree of life. They will go and eat of the tree of life clearly in the transition of the new heaven and the new earth. This is though there will be a decision made by the end of the thousand years. Everybody who goes and gathers himself, and the scripture says, as the sand upon the seashore, they'll gather themselves unto Satan at the end of living with God for a thousand years. Those who do not, we know that they go into the eternal perfect earth. 
And we definitely know at that stage, Revelation chapter 22, that when the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, the streets are going to have, they're going to be lined with what? The tree of life. Wow. And so we know that, haha, <laughs> praise the name of Jesus. Well, you know, actually, did you know that we get to eat of the, every one of us eat of the tree of life, eating the resurrection saints? Did you know that? Uh, Revelation, uh, I believe it is, it's chapter 2, pretty sure. Revelation chapter 2 says, Blessed is he uh, who overcomes, because he would grant the right to eat of the tree of life. And he's talking about the resurrection saints there, the church there. Everybody's going to take that tree. Amen. Everybody's going to live with God's going to take that tree. Wonder what's going to happen. Huh? When they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, men came into a place that there was no way they had the capacity or the ability to deal with it. It's the knowledge of God. Okay? When we're redeemed, we're given a new heart, new spirit, but the knowledge of good and evil is not taken away. We still have to deal with that. And man, within the framework of who he is, does not have the wherewithal or the ability. We have to have the wisdom of the Holy Ghost to deal with the knowledge of good and evil, to understand the beauty and the life and the good and how to refuse the evil. Jesus was taught by God. He, the Scripture says he desired the things of the Word, using it allegorically, milk and honey shall you eat, that you may learn to choose the good and refuse the evil. And because he chose righteousness and hated iniquity, choosing good and, and refusing evil, God anointed him with the oil of gladness above all others. Because he stood up where Adam fell. He went beyond what even the most righteous and perfect men, men like. Uh, there's three righteous and perfect men named in the scripture. Three, three perfect men, I mean, named in the scripture. Noah, true. Yehov, Jacob, and Job. People didn't know that. You know, it says, the scripture says that Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture says he was a perfect man who dwelt in a tent. That's just, that's holding. See, that's one of the places where I say, when I say, when I say things like certain scriptures have been held in prison through a translation. That's one. And then now they make all these speculations about Yaakov. And God called him a perfect man. I'm not going to call somebody a deceiver that God called perfect. Huh? I'm going to understand he's a heel grabber and that you could actually make a heel grabber and the word Hebrew word for heel grabber mean a deceiver. A one who operates in subtil with subtility. But it wasn't his idea to deceive Isaac. It was his mama's. And she said, let it be on my head. Huh. So why don't we just let it be on her head start talking about her. <laughs> Amen. God appointed it in the second place. Amen. Or, well, we're in the first place. First place, God appointed it. Second place, it was Rachel's idea. Hallelujah. Rebecca's idea, forgive me. So, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, people want to talk about the flesh. Well, if you didn't have the flesh nature, how would you have the thought of sin? Hello. Why don't you read the Bible again, understand that the Lord has, we've been born in spirit, given the divine nature, and that, lo and behold, you have the good knowledge of good and evil. When will somebody start talking about that? Because, see, what happens is we won't always talk about something that's not there. It's a distraction, and now there's no faith to deal with it. Huh? I can't deal with a lie. I can deal with the truth. Now, if I know, wait a minute, I've got something that man stole, that Adam stole, and I need to understand that I have to depend upon the wisdom of the Holy Ghost to rely wholly and solely upon him to be able to deal with this thing. And so it's very important to grab a hold of that. But a beautiful thing of it is, is we all get to come eat the tree of life. And you think about the transitions that are going to take place there. I think there's something going to happen there that is going to explode everybody who partakes of it into a divine realm of God's glory that we can't even begin to imagine. You talk about unveiling, revealing. See, 
Satan's always a liar. Can I, can I just go ahead and give you my clues? This is me. This is me. I'm talking about me. This is my speculation. Satan is a liar. Okay? He's always twisting everything up. He's taking the truth and superimposing upon the lie, taking the lie and superimposing upon the truth. So he said, eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God doesn't want you to have it because he knows that in the day that you eat it, you'll be like him. That was the tree of life. I, I believe that. I believe it. There's something unique about his life and his glory. You say, well, we got his life and his glory, his fullness. Yeah, yeah. But there's still something unique here. Okay. Once again, I said, that's my speculation. Did I say that my speculation? Okay. I think it's pretty good speculation, though. <laughs> something unique about that tree of life. Huh? It's more than the taste. Have you ever been into some fruit that you've never eaten before? You go, wow, you just enjoyed every bite of it. It's just like, this is intense, right? Take it to a spiritual level on the level of a whole new realms of the ages and, and all that God has done and all that he is and a un total unveiling of all the splendor that exists only in him in a bite. Did I answer your question? Was there another hand? <laughs> Chris is going, did you answer her question? <laughs> you went off. <laughs> okay, there's a question. There is no death during the millennium. There is death during the millennium. There is no indication that there isn't death. What there is is this, okay? Okay? There is among those that are living that obey God and do that which is right, no death. Okay? But there is judgment going on. So there is judgment going on. God deals with it, is ruling with a rod of iron. He deals with it immediately. Think about this. Isaiah says that where Babylon is and where the Antichrist and Satan will set up their seat of worship, he's going to blow that thing up, man. It's going to be a hole that goes right down into the earth to where that people during the millennial will come and look down into hell and see the souls of those that are in hell and the torment. Because the, their, remember I read that to you? How that, that, that the smoke will, from that place of hell where the Antichrist and the beast are cast in will continually ascend up as a furnace before God and before the Lamb. Remember that? That's that hole. Isaiah talks about it. You be able to look down in it. So my, who knows? Maybe it's an annual pilgrimage. Everybody, okay, come over and look. You better obey God. This is what happened to those who rebelled against him and chose the ways of death and iniquity. Huh? Humanists are up in arms about this right now. They heard me say that. They were like, that's not God. Uh, that's God. I don't want to serve him. That's God. And you do want to serve him. Hallelujah. You just don't understand. It's been all twisted and spun out of proportion. So in the judgment, if people, there's a judgment. There's a judgment that comes down. And the plagues of Egypt come upon those who don't come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. That's what the Lord described in Zechariah. There's an instantaneous judgment. He rules with a rod of iron, subjecting nations bringing nations under his rule and under his reign. If they rebel and will not listen, it's judgment right there, immediately. Everything that's described concerning the millennial reign, it is on back to instantaneous and immediate judgment. Pretty radical, eh? Ooh, put that in your theological library and consider it. Or into the religious pipe and smoke it. <laughs> yes. You know, I say a lot of things by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I, I do. I mean, that, 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 that the Lord gives me wisdom for the moment, and I don't even know. I mean, somebody said, said I was talking about one of their favorite pets, and I don't even, but I was actually speaking in tongues. Nonetheless, but 
I, all I was saying is this. I was saying that love knows nothing. There is no tolerance. Uh, God has no tolerance for sin. Okay? Uh, and and, and um, what you're saying right now, it doesn't come to me. So I can try to mentally figure it out or it comes right out of my spirit. So what did you say again? I'll see if... Okay. Just huh? Compromise. Compromise. That was it. There you go. There you go. Praise God. All right. Amen. That was it. In the mouth of two or three witnesses. Woo! Yeah, that works. No, I, I don't get this stuff because I got it from or put it in my memory banks or learned it. It just comes up out of my spirit. And so usually, you know, others will hopefully that are listening i should listen better i guess right <laughs> sometimes i'm too busy flowing in the holy ghost to listen too much but it's there amen Hallelujah. any other questions yeah they are not kind of they are contained yeah. they are these bound for a thousand years That's right. Okay. So there's rebellion during the millennial reign, but then what's going on with the, the Men can be a devil without the devil. They can be a demon without a demon. They, through their own creative forces, can carry on what Satan does uh, within the framework of, of, of iniquity. Remember, you know, people are going to come up out of the millennial reign. Here is an interesting thing to consider, Okay. They come up, forgive me, they're going to come up out of the tribulation, okay? Consider this. They come up out of the tribulation. When they come up out of the tribulation, into the, into the millennial reign, don't you reckon that they're going to be born of the Spirit, that they're going to be born again, they're going to call upon the name of Jesus, they're going to be born of, just like we're born again, brought into the kingdom? Huh? Well, sure they are. From king to peasant, everybody will be saved. The only people that potentially would not be saved and not born again and give a new heart and new spirit, okay, they would be those folks that would be dealt with in, in the judgments of God. So it really compounds the issue. It compounds the issue for us. Well, wait a minute. Hold up. There's no demons. There's no devil. There's no evil nature because they've all been born again how on earth could anybody rebel against God once again man is possessor of the knowledge of good and evil he has something that he was not does not have the capacity to handle and to, and would not have the capacity to handle until other things take place in his life through God I don't know how that all works I would imagine I can only imagine that maybe a billion years from then, or a million years, or whatever, and after having the tree of life, and after having walked with God, and learned perfect submission, that the Lord says, now let me show you something different. Let me show you something more that goes on here. Remember, Satan was a creation of God, as it were, even in lower form. Okay? And this is where Augustine missed this. You know, these other guys who wrote copious amounts of of theological ideas that has been handed down uh, to, the, to the church ever since. They, they failed to recognize this. Lucifer, whoever he, whatever his name was, out of his own, and he, once again, a lower creation with respect to what God made man to be. Creatively, okay? And endowed with greater gifting for what father's purposed us to be in him when he created adam goes beyond that of the category of angels just simply by the fact that we're going to rule and reign with them that we're going to judge angels that the place that, that he's called us to be in him and he created evil adam was perfectly innocent 
created in all the image of Father. Outward appearance, inward like likeness. What did he do? Chose rebellion. So that potential exists. We're redeemed. Right now, every one of us have the divine nature. But we have these influences. We have memory. We have, all the, we have the right to choose. Are we going to choose to obey God? It comes down to the force of our will. Did I see another hand back this way? Somebody raise their hand. You're okay. Um, so what I'm having a hard time understanding there is now I understand that you're wrong. If someone convicted you against sin, they have to act on spirit. So that is correct. Then at that point, just out of your own will of And remember there's another part and dimension that let no man say when he is tempted that he is tempted of God, for God can tempt no man with evil, but when he is tempted, he is drawn away of his own strong desires. So right now, within the framework of things as they exist right now, the demonic is fully integrated with that. There's no separating those two things out. When you sin, you're participating with the evil spirit. But it, nonetheless, what James said in James chapter 1, beginning verse 14, is still the truth. It's still a part of it, still a dimension of it. He's drawn away of his own strong desires and enticed. And then that brings forth in that enticement, that being lured in because he wants something for himself that is opposed to God, it brings forth sin and sin, death. So, but remember this. I want to say this. I want to say this in this context. I don't believe sin is going to be rampant. Dude, we're talking about a supercharged atmosphere with no demon power. It's completely reverse of what we have right now. Instead of an atmosphere supercharged with demon power and all the marketing and all the billboards and all the advertisement and all the current of humanity running into a realm of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, the world is literally saturated only by the influences of divine love and holiness and purity and the glory of God and angels shouting and the saints shouting and praising God living in the beauty of this life. It's an entirely, it's a deluge of glory. Hallelujah. How so? I mean, I'm telling you, come on. Father, and Father is purging, however, the earth, the world of men of all iniquity in that place. So where did, so now take this next thought. Because now you develop that much more to take that next step. What Satan did will be completely so purged out of humanity and out of creation that it, there is no possibility of it happening again in the future. So imagine that. And I believe in part it, there's a connectivity with the tree of life in that. Eating of the tree of life. Satan had to get to man before they ate the tree of life. People act like that. People act like say that uh, man was in the garden for weeks. He wasn't. I don't think he was in the gar garden for hours. I don't even know if he was in the garden for more than a 24-hour period of time, after after um, after creation was finished. After the seventh day, and God rested. The eighth day, it could have been it. Um, because God blessed them. And they had not had, Eve had not conceived. And it wasn't like Adam didn't know what to do. He knew perfectly well what to do. And it just didn't happen. It wasn't time. And besides that, Satan knew he had, he had only a short period of time to do his work. Because you're not going to hang around God too long and not fall in love with him. Hmm? So... Father's going to purge out the eventuality of that ever happening. Just try to wrap your head around that. There will be no more sin. There will only be righteousness. The heavens purged of it. Creation purged of it. And from everything that God has revealed, there is not only, there, there is no more display ever again throughout all the ages of either sin or wrath. It's done. It's finished. Beautiful. Amen.
Did I see a hand over here? Hand over here. Yeah. Outside of the realms of God. No, it is, it is a contrast between those who are included in the first resurrection and those who are cast out into outer darkness, which is contained within the framework of the lake of fire. So the, the city and the impact of the city and the effect of the city covers the whole of the, of the cosmos. There's no other way to understand that verse of Scripture. The only thing that is with outside of the framework of the city is hell. So those um, part of the second resurrection, where none of us are going to and not get stopped. Yeah. Well, you're not going to. Yeah. Because you, you'll be part of the first resurrection. You'll be part of the first resurrection. You'll have a glorified body. You'll see him as he is because you'll be like him. Okay? Now, you're that way forever, praise God. Isn't that good news? Now, the earthly people that go into the millennial reign of Christ into that thousand-year period, no, physically they will not die if they don't disobey if they walk with God so the question is is there a possibility that they would disobey during that period of time and sin yes what will happen immediate judgment and then you know and then that's why we've been talking about this whole issue of well how is that going to happen there's no demon power there's no demon influence they're born again they've got to be born again I can't imagine a millennial anybody coming into no one can come into the kingdom of God unless they're born again. <laughs> and the millennial reign ain't the kingdom of God. I don't know what is. I mean, you know what I'm saying. Right? So how is it that people are going to do that? That then that is the category of where judgment will fall and death will be incurred. It will not be a delayed judgment. Everything that the prophets say. Every indication in Scripture concerning that time period, there's no delay in judgment. If you sin, you die. It's immediately dealt with. So it's almost like going back to Old Testament time. It's what really trips people up about Ezekiel. Because Ezekiel, Ezekiel is the one who describes the millennial temple, the millennial conditions, and the results of what happens in the millennial reign of Christ more than any of the other prophets. And that's why it's very good to study very accurately. It's just a difficult, it's a difficult book of the Bible to study because there's a lot of hard concepts to wrap your head around and details. But it's very insightful. So what you're basically trying to say is like an act where the guy who sells his property gives the money to uh, Peter, I think it is, and he lies to him. And Ananias and Sapphira. Immediate judgment, yeah. Well, and then the Old Testament, too. It's immediate judgment, too, you know. Okay? Any, anybody else? Questions? Love every one of you. Thank you so much for coming here and encouraging me tonight. So I didn't just have to talk to one or two people and just believe God for a massive audience over there on the web. No. I'm going to tell you right now, I do just the same by the help and the grace of God for one or two people as for however many, because everybody's important. You're here because, amen. amen. God brought you here. We're happy about it.